Police have confirmed this week that some of the bones found on the Sunderland coast are in fact human. This could be someone's loved one and police are now working to identify who this person is. If you hadn't heard about this yet, there were various reports that came in throughout February and March of body parts or bones being found at multiple locations in Sunderland, including Marine Walk near Taroka Beach and Queen's Parade in Seaburn. Some of the bones were quickly identified as being that of a baby seal, but other bones have been confirmed as being human. There could of course be a number of explanations for these body parts, an accidental drowning, a suicide, or it could be something more sinister. There were reports that I read of some of the body parts being found wrapped in plastic, which leads me to believe that it is something more sinister, but these reports have not been confirmed. I'll keep an eye out for any developments on this case and I really hope they can identify this person so that they can be properly laid to rest. I seen this, this video, it was a ghost call or whatever. So this police dispatcher received a call from a funeral home, but it was closed. And this happened at 3.28 a.m. by the way. I'm gonna let you guys hear the call and stuff. And let me see what you guys hear. Uh, oh, I hate bro. hearing things, bro. It respects the cops, bro, because I feel like cops oh, be yeah, seeing some yeah, and yeah, they can't yeah. say anything. Hello? Hello? Um... Hello? Okay, I heard like, hello, and it's cold. I heard, I heard it guys. Apparently, the guy said, help me, and then after she said hello again, I said help. Did yeah, because I heard, I heard, can you help me? And then they go send out police, a unit yeah. to go to check out what, what's going on, if everything's okay. Guy gets there, realizes that the place is locked up. Place oh, is locked up, bro. bro. It's dark as in there and there's no sign of like life in the building bro uh, so it's like who the fuck would have called at that time yeah where was that at colorado if there are any cops out there who experience freaky shit let us call you let's bro. hear that scary shit you know what's the craziest part too this is the moment walter medina was apprehended last week after holding a woman hostage for over two months and subjecting her to horrific abuse the victim burst through the door of a gas station on April 1st. She was visibly bruised and beaten and she was asking for help. Staff immediately called 911 but Walter managed to escape in his van. A high speed chase ensued with Lakeland Police Department and Florida Highway Patrol hot on Walter's tail. He flew down the highway at speeds reaching 100 miles per hour and eventually he crashed into a barrier wrecking his van. He stepped out of his van and as he reached back inside, presumably for a weapon, the police deployed their canine Rico and he took Walter down to the ground. Walter was arrested and he was stretched away and his victim was taken to hospital. She had multiple broken ribs from being beaten with a baseball bat. She had extensive bruising all over her face and body and she had multiple puncture wounds from being stabbed with a screwdriver. Walter Medina has previously served prison time for false imprisonment after kidnapping another woman and he now faces multiple charges including armed kidnapping and attempted murder in the second degree. What this woman escaped from is like something from a horror film. Earlier this week a dramatic scene unfolded in Florida. It was a typical Monday morning in Tampa with people going about their usual business. That was until a van appeared in the local area. A woman escaped from the van and ran to ask for help. She flew into the Walgreens pharmacy and begged people to ring police. Horrifically, the woman had several injuries on her body, including on her face and puncture wounds. The staff rang police, who immediately turned up to investigate. Now, the woman had her identity withheld, but it transpired that she'd allegedly met a man named Walter Medina in January. She told police that he'd assaulted her with a baseball bat and a screwdriver. The 48-year-old man was arrested after a dramatic car chase that ended in a crash. He was charged with multiple offences, including attempted murder and armed kidnapping. The woman alleged that the man had been keeping her captive in his house, torturing her and assaulting her for an agonising two months. She states that he gave her substances and was mentally and physically abusive. The woman actually had broken ribs and was taken to hospital. She said that she'd been transported by a van by him and used the opportunity to escape when he left the van. Officers stated this suspect's violent reign of terror is finally over. 
disturbing episode of La Rosa de Guadalupe. Ooh. This episode was about Justin Bieber, right? Really? Justin Bieber was going to be in Monterrey, Mexico. And a lot of people were going crazy over Justin Bieber tickets. Like all the teenage girls wanting to see all their crush. It starts off with these girls. They're around the age of 13 or 14. Super hardcore believers. If you see in the room, they literally have like pictures all over. It. So obviously they want to get tickets as well. The tickets are like those mil pesos, which is like a hundred and something dollars US. But Rosaura is like, oh, I don't want my kids anymore. I'm really wondering what the fuck this is called. So Lolita, she's even like, oh, I'm going to get a job. She ends up getting a job at a little cafe. They find out these tickets are getting sold online as a pre-sale. And they're like, fuck, how are we even going to get the ticket? The girls end up saying like, yo, we should camp for them. And they stay there all fucking night the next morning comes they're sold out and then out of nowhere rosada is like i'm gonna put on social media is there anybody who has a ticket i will give them my virginity for a ticket I had a feeling it was gonna end like and this. she ends up gaslighting her into saying she should do it too she's like you're right i have to do whatever it takes to see just to be here. a couple days pass and like some guy tries to approach lolita at her job she's like what are you doing dirty and he's like you're the one who posted this shit on social media what the fuck out of nowhere her friend rosada comes to school with a fucking ticket all hype and Another girl that has a ticket as well is like, let me see your ticket. They compare it to each other. Your ticket kind of looks off. They go to like the booth and shit to make sure if it's real or not. They scan it and it's like, nah, like this ticket doesn't work. It's fake. She goes to the guy. This woman from Cheshire killed her boyfriend by running him over with her car. It was spring 2022 and philosophy student Alice Wood was dating Ryan Watson. Ryan was just 24 years old and was working as a support worker for the brain injury charity Headway. The pair were living together in Road Heath and had recently bought a home together. It was around 11.30pm on the 6th of May when the pair were attending a party in Stoke-on-Trent. They'd both been drinking and tension was growing throughout the night. Witnesses reported that Ryan had been getting on quite well with another female at the party and Alice wasn't happy. Alice accused Ryan of flirting with the other female and the pair started arguing about who should drive home. It's reported that Alice then drove the pair about 15 minutes back to their home in Oak Street in Road Heath. Neighbours then reported hearing shouting, slamming of doors and the revving of a car. When Ryan was out of the vehicle, Alice used the car as a weapon and launched the vehicle at him. She intentionally drove at him three times. On the third attempt, she did hit him with the vehicle and dragged him over 150 metres along the road. She then decided to stop the car and pretended to neighbours that it was an accident. She asked the neighbour to ring the ambulance for them. Ryan's cause of death was determined to be crush asphyxiation. Alice wrote to the judge to claim that she didn't murder her boyfriend, she simply used the car as a weapon for intimidation. The judge did not accept this and ultimately Alice was sentenced to 18 years in prison for murder. Martin Weiss is another Nickelodeon pedophile that they don't want you talking about. And he defended pedophilia allegations against him by claiming that his 11-year-old victim wanted it. This is Martin Weiss. He's a former Hollywood talent agent and a pedophile. Back in 2011, one of Martin Weiss's former clients, an 18-year-old actor turned musician, reported him to the police. This client claimed that Martin Weiss sexually assaulted him from the age of 11 all the way till the age of 15 or the entire time that he was his talent agent. Martin Weiss also threatened the victim's career. This is a quote from the press release. They said, the victim said Martin told him that what they were doing was common practice in the entertainment industry. And if the victim were to tell anyone, it would ruin the victim's career and hurt them both. The victim though, finally fed up with the abuse and fearing for the safety of other children, went to the police. That's when Martin was ultimately arrested and charged with eight felonies. But as reported in the LA Times when Martin was confronted by authorities about the assault of a minor, he claimed the kid wanted it. This is a quote from the LA Times. During the November 15th conversation, Martin Weiss claimed the boy invited the interaction and claimed that the Penn State situation was different because those kids didn't want it. So Martin Weiss, who was a prolific talent agent, worked on a number of different shows like iCarly, Parenthood, The Muppet Movie. So yeah, this is extremely disturbing, and I think that the Nickelodeon reckoning is still going to continue for a while. This is the Pitbull video, one of the hardest cartel execution videos to watch explained. The video that I'm about to explain is extremely graphic, and I don't recommend searching for it. The video begins with a man lying on his back on the ground, and two men are holding his legs open. He's being restrained, and in total, there is five perpetrators and one victim and also two pit bull dogs. Apparently, this is the victim's punishment for allegedly doing something with a kid or to a kid. The victim is naked and at the start of the video, the dog has done most of the work. 
The dog already ripped off the man's privates and it's just a bloody mess. The dog continues to rip pieces of flesh off of where his privates used to be, and the victim is being held down and he is also gagged so he can't scream. But sometimes the gag came loose and at this point you could hear the man scream in pain. The victim was even talking but I couldn't translate it but that means he was completely conscious during this. Which I can't even imagine the pain. As a man, this might be one of the worst videos out there. Funky Town is bad, Ghost Rider is bad, but as a man, I can't imagine anything more painful than a pit bull ripping off your junk while you're still alive. Not many people mention this video with the other disturbing ones, but it's definitely up there. There's not any information about the victim after the video. I don't know if he died, but it's safe to assume he did. He lost a lot of blood, and if a dog eats your privates, you will most likely get an infection and die from it. All in all, this video is very graphic, very real, and very disturbing. Please do yourself a favor and never go searching for this video, especially if you're a man. So this is incredibly disturbing. A teacher at a Christian school in Florida was just arrested for using a yearbook to make images of his underage students online. You can't make this stuff up. This is what's happening every day here in America. So this is 67-year-old Stephen Hauser. He taught third grade science at the Beacon Christian Academy in Newport Ritchie, Florida. Now, everybody seemed to love Stephen. That is until an anonymous tip was made recently that led to his arrest. So, according to Stephen himself, yes, he admitted this, he used a yearbook containing photos of his students to generate these child corn images. I don't know exactly how many videos or photos Stephen had in his possession, but he admitted to using three of his underage students' photos to create this disgusting material. And according to a news report, authorities found two CP photos and three CP videos in Stephen's possession. I don't know if that stuff was AI generated or not, but either way, this is just a disturbing, sick story. And it's frightening thinking about how predators like this guy are going to be able to use AI and technology like that to fulfill these sick and twisted fantasies that they have. Like, what regulations do we have to prohibit this stuff from happening? After all, a tip from somebody was what got Steven arrested. Who knows how many millions of other people are out there doing this sort of thing, that haven't been caught and may not ever be caught. It's truly just some disturbing stuff and I hate even thinking about it. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. These are family photos with disturbing backstories. Up first is a picture of a father and daughter, right? Well, this is Franklin Delano Floyd and Suzanne Savakis. And Franklin kidnapped Suzanne in 1974 when she was under the age of 10. It was his stepdaughter, and he would go on to raise her as his own daughter, putting her through high school under several pseudonyms and having a son with her in 1988. He would then marry her in 1989 under the name Tanya Hughes. In 1990, Suzanne had decided to leave Franklin and take her son Michael with her. And in April of that year, she was found beaten and bruised on the side of the highway. And she would eventually die in the hospital. Michael then went into foster care and was adopted only to be kidnapped by Franklin Floyd in 1994 and never to be seen again. Next up is just a normal family photo, right? Well, the man in the yellow sweater is actually John Edward Robinson, who is a serial killer. And the baby that he's holding is Tiffany Stassi, whose mother he murdered the day before. He later gave baby Tiffany to his brother, saying she was adopted. His brother, along with Tiffany, didn't find out the truth for 15 years. Only eight of his victims have ever been identified, and he's been on death row since 2000. Finally is just a picture of a mother with her two sons. Well, the kid on the right's name is Bart Whittaker, and he paid two of his buddies to murder his family that night. They would kill the mother and brother, but the father who took the photo survived. Bart Whittaker was sentenced to death, but after his father strongly opposed of it, which makes no sense, Texas Governor Greg Abbott granted him clemency and he is now serving a life sentence. The child's death was thought to be an accident until shocking text messages were revealed. It was the 15th of June 2023. Samantha Wishman was 32 years old living in Wisconsin with her boyfriend and his three-year-old son. Police were called to a home in Marinette on the day in question by Samantha. 
She reported that the three-year-old had fallen down the stairs the night before. When officers arrived at the property, the little boy was not breathing. According to police, the father of the child seemed really frantic and wanted to get him to hospital straight away. Samantha, however, was reportedly much more calm and seemed to be trying to get the other children under control. The boy tragically passed away after being rushed to hospital. Now, initially, the child's death was classed as an accident, but that's when everything started to change. Investigators determined that the death was not an accident as a result of a fall. This was after the autopsy showed that the child had broken ribs, a punctured lung, concussion and bruising on his head and body. It was determined that he died from blunt force trauma. Investigators seized Samantha's phone as part of the investigation and what they found was truly chilling. She allegedly sent disturbing text messages to the child's dad stating, I'm ready to hurt these mother bleep kids. Nobody bleep understands. I can't breathe. This is so much harder now that I'm having more problems breathing. These mother bleep won't bleep stop. I'm ready to lose my bleep. I can't breathe. I can't yell. So I'm just the joke around here. An expert claimed that the injuries on the boy's body were no accident. Samantha is now facing charges of first degree reckless homicide and neglecting a child. This girl was killed and had all of her teeth removed by a cartel member while on vacation in Mexico. The body of 23-year-old Lisbeth Flores was found dead in the Mexican town of Matamoros. The sad thing is, Lisbeth was a mother of two and was also visiting Mexico for vacation. On August 9th, 2023, Lisbeth told her mother that she would be crossing the border into Matamoros to visit her boyfriend. Lisbeth assured her mother that she would return later that evening. This wasn't her first time crossing the border, but for some reason, her decision to do it did not sit right with her mother at all. Maybe it was her instincts telling her something bad was going to happen. But regardless, she let Lisbeth go. However, when Lisbeth failed to return home that night, her mother knew something was wrong. She filed a missing persons report immediately the next morning. But tragically, the day after filing, Mexican officials discover Lisbeth's lifeless body abandoned on a field in Matamoros and the condition of her remains were absolutely horrific. She had been brutally assaulted and all of her teeth were removed from her mouth before she died. And the fatal injury seemed to be from a powerful blow to the head using this large rock that was discovered at the scene. Some say it was robbery, others say it was sexual assault, but no one really knows what happened exactly between Lisbeth and her killer. The good thing is the killer was arrested. Braulio Martinez was caught at his residence in connection with the murder, and after pleading no contest, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison, which many people thought wasn't a long enough sentence. This is just so sad, and due to the violence in this area, Lisbeth's mother is now without a child, and her own two kids are left without a mother. But luckily, local businesses stepped up by contributing funds to her children's education. As this kind gesture definitely helped, nothing will bring back their mother, Lisbeth Flores. May she rest in peace. The death of Lil Peep is always a story that makes me sad. So if you don't know who Lil Peep was, he was a songwriter, a rapper, a producer, musician, and he helped kind of pioneer the emo trap movement. So Lil Peep, whose real name is Gustav, really shot to stardom in 2016, 2017. He had been making music for a long time before that, but it was in those years when people really started to notice him. He started appearing on the covers of magazines, and he amassed a huge fan base. Now, I actually was going to go see Lil Peep a night or two before he died. He played in Texas, and I was going to go see him, but I remember saying to my friend, oh, I'll catch him the next time that he comes to town, but sadly, that didn't happen. So, on November 15th, 2017, Lil Peep was in Arizona. He was playing a show in Tucson that night, but nobody had really heard from him for a while. And at that point, the tour manager headed onto the tour bus to see what was up with him. And that's when he discovered the already lifeless body of Lil Peep. The official cause of Lil Peep's death was an overdose. At the time of his death, he had Xanax, fentanyl, marijuana, cocaine, tramadol, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, and oxycodone and oxymorphone, which is an absolutely insane amount of drugs in his system. But it's some of Lil Peep's final posts on Instagram on the day of his death that are really haunting. In this video, posted only a few hours before he would go on to pass away, Lil Peep is seen dropping an unidentified pill around his mouth trying to swallow it. Obviously, I can't show the video here because I don't want this to get taken down, but it really is haunting. 
And shortly after this, keep in mind, this is the day he died. He made this post that said, when I die, you'll love me, featuring him performing on stage. Sadly, he would pass away only a few hours after posting this. There's no doubt that Lil Peep fundamentally changed the music industry and he would have been one of the biggest stars of today if he were still with us. I still miss him a lot. I still listen to his music all the time. And yeah, this is just a very, very sad story. Oh my God, have a total weirdo in my bathroom, a little scared, is one of the last text messages this woman ever sent before she was murdered. Sherry Carter was a 29 year old aspiring lawyer from Florida. It was the 31st of January 2011 and Sherry was trying to make some extra money to get herself through law school. She started working as an escort in order to fund her studies and posted an online ad for clients under the pseudonym Stephanie. A local police officer named Jimmy Dak Ho responded to the ad. Jimmy hadn't been working that day and made arrangements to go to Sherry's apartment in Boynton Beach. When he arrived to her home at 4.40 p.m., he actually went to go and get undressed in the bathroom when she sent that text message to her boyfriend. She'd begun to have second thoughts and sent the text to her boyfriend in order to raise an alarm. Her boyfriend kind of misjudged this situation and texts back in a joking manner, don't let him sniff my deodorant lol. He obviously hadn't realized she was in actual danger. She texts back saying, no really, you have no clue. Just minutes after she sent the text, Jimmy came out of the bathroom, handcuffed her and then shot her twice. It was Sherry's boyfriend who discovered her a while later on the floor of her apartment. He obviously immediately called emergency services and she was rushed to hospital. Tragically, she passed away four days later. Officers went through Sherry's phone and identified Jimmy through phone records. When questioned, he claimed that he'd changed his mind about the arrangement with Sherry and refused to pay her. He said he acted in self-defense and that his gun had gone off by mistake. He denied murder and the case went to trial. The court heard how Jimmy had actually got angry when she refused to sleep with him and he handcuffed her and shot her in the abdomen and the neck. CCTV footage was used to paint a picture of what happened that day. Jimmy arrived at 4.40 p.m. and left at just 4.56 p.m. He threw the murder weapon into a nearby canal and casually went out for food with his girlfriend that night. It was later revealed that Jimmy did have an extensive history of being abusive towards women. He'd been physically and verbally abusive and had also made inappropriate advances. He was found guilty of both kidnapping and murder and given two life sentences. Not in the car. No, I'm not. You're going to jail. Oh my God. Whoa, what the f you are going? What the f***? Trey, get it on video. Trey, get it on video. I'm getting it on video. Trey, get it on video. Get it on video. Get it on video. The woman you just saw in that video getting pulled out of the car by the cop is Samantha Alonzo Luna. So on June 16th, 2018, Samantha was driving with her friend outside of a local oyster festival. That's when officers associated with the local Humboldt State University pulled her friend's car over. So according to the officers, one of the people in the car was sticking their head out of a sunroof. And that's what led to them pulling the vehicle over. So after the car gets pulled over, Samantha's friend gets arrested, and Samantha starts questioning the officers exactly why her friend was arrested. The officers then started questioning Samantha. So when questioned by the police, Samantha told the officers that her last name was Luna. But they tried to argue that on her license, it said Alonzo Luna. And even though Samantha pleaded and told them that her last name is Luna, these officers weren't having any of it, and they dragged her out of the car and immediately began screaming at her that she's going to jail. And this whole interaction escalated to an absolutely insane level. Because during all of this, Samantha grabbed the hair of the blonde police officer. And other officers had to come with scissors to cut the officer's hair off so that she could get free. The video of all of this is pretty strange and disturbing. But did officers have enough to actually arrest Samantha from the very beginning? Well, she was eventually handed seven charges, including giving false information to a police officer, public intoxication, battery on a peace officer and four violations of resisting officials. So Samantha actually opted for a jury trial, which was supposed to happen in 2020, but with what happened in 2020, I couldn't find any information on what exactly happened at the end of this case. So let me know below, whose side are you on here? Who do you think was in the right? Who do you think was in the wrong? And if you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. This is the Cartel Baseball Bat video, one of the worst execution videos explained. Whatever you do, never go searching for this video. The video that I'm about to explain is about 5 minutes in length, and it opens with a message from the cartel that says the following. 
this is what's going to happen to people who betray us. And according to sources, the victim in the video is a police officer. As the video plays, you see a shirtless man in shorts lying on the ground and is also blindfolded. The setting is in an empty concrete room and there are two cartel members in the room with him. The one has a baseball bat and he then winds up and hits the victim in the side of the body, making sure the victim is not hit in the head. This process is then repeated several times. The victim is hit on the back, stomach, legs, and arms countless of times, all while he wiggles on the floor in unbelievable pain. The video then proceeds the jump cut, and after every one of these jump cuts, you see the bruises on the victim become more visible. According to reports, the victim died from all the striking from the bat, and I can't imagine the pain he was feeling, due to internal bleeding, broken bones, and fractures. Later in the video, the victim is lying on his stomach and isn't moving that much. He is then hit with the bat on the back of his neck several times, and this appears to kill the victim or knock him unconscious. The video then jump cuts again, and the victim has been stripped completely naked, and appears to be dead. At this point, you see a cartel member carrying a double-sided medieval axe, and he then proceeds to dismember the victim's body. He starts by cutting off the right arm of the victim, and after this, he takes the axe, and decapitates the corpse after a couple axe swings. The victim's head is then held up to the camera in the usual cartel style. The video then jump cuts again and continues showing the dismembering process. And the killer with the axe is cutting off the victim's legs at the top of the thigh. At which point the video then concludes. This video is an extremely brutal watch, and I highly, highly recommend you never go searching for it. This is just another one of those videos that makes you aware of the brutality that goes on in this world. And it's absolutely sickening and terrifying. Did you know that there's an alien buried in the state of Texas? And yes, I'm talking about the corpse of an extraterrestrial being. So this is the Aurora Cemetery in Aurora, Texas. It's in North Texas. And yes, inside of the cemetery, there is a grave that belongs to a supposedly extraterrestrial being. So this alien plane crash actually happened supposedly in 1897. On April 17th of that year, an alien UFO supposedly crashed into a windmill and crash landed on the property of local judge J.S. Proctor. This is actually what the crash site looks like today. I love how they've kind of gone with the theme. But everybody who came to look at the remains of this alien ship noticed that the person inside of it that was piloting it was not of this world. They even called it in the original news report a Martian. So what's interesting is that the town allegedly got together and decided that this alien deserved a Christian burial. So they brought it to the Aurora Cemetery and buried the alien in a Christian ceremony. Here's what the gravesite used to look like. It's got a little UFO on the side of it. So allegedly, the wreckage from the crash was dumped into a nearby well, which was underneath the windmill that was damaged. And the rest of the wreckage was actually buried with this alien's body. So in 1935, another man bought the crash site property from Judge J.S. Proctor. And he cleaned out the well, got rid of all the wreckage, but he claims that after drinking the water that was in the well, he developed a severe case of arthritis. And thus, he covered the well up with a concrete slab and sealed it permanently. So this is where the grave is marked today. I actually visited this cemetery a few years ago, and it's really strange to think that an alien might be buried here. So various alien researchers have visited the cemetery, and they've came to some pretty shocking conclusions. So at one point, people tried to deny the story and say that it was a hoax and that a windmill never existed on the original property. But a television crew actually found the remains of an old windmill there. And the guy who actually owns the land allowed a TV crew to unseal the well. They found a large amount of aluminum in the well, and the landowner actually gave them pieces of the wreckage. When they analyzed it, they found that the wreckage was made of aluminum and another unknown element. They couldn't figure out what it was made out of. And then we get to the grave, and this is crazy. So people have repeatedly asked the city for permission to dig up this unmarked grave. But the cemetery actually denies people that request every single time. I don't know why they're denying this request, if they just want to keep the mystery alive or what, but nobody knows what's buried there. And interestingly enough, another TV crew came out and did ground-penetrating radar, and they did detect an anomaly, which meant that there is more than likely a chance that there is a body under there. But because it was so badly deteriorated, they couldn't get good readings and they don't know what the remains belong to. So yeah, I would love for somebody to finally figure out this mystery because it's something that keeps me awake at night. 
But if you ever want to visit it, you can go to the Aurora Cemetery and they actually have a plaque that tells the story of the alien that's buried there. This is the Timothy Pitson case, the boy who has been missing for more than 12 years. On May 11th, 2011, six-year-old Timothy Pitson was dropped off at school in Illinois by his father, James Pitson. He was picked up shortly after by his mother, Amy Fry Pitson, who took him on a three-day trip to various amusement parks and water parks. But Amy Pitson's body was found in a motel room in the city of Rockford, Illinois, having died by suicide, with a note stating that Timothy was safe, but he would never be found. Between 12 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. on May 13, 2011, Amy Pitson telephoned several family members, including her mother and brother-in-law, telling them that she and Timothy were safe and not in any danger. Amy Pitson failed to contact her husband, however, who had been attempting to locate the pair, after being notified by his son's school that he was not present when he arrived to pick him up at the end of the school day. Timothy was heard in the background during the calls saying that he was hungry. At 7.25 p.m. on May 13, 2011, Amy Pitson was seen alone on security camera at a family dollar store in Illinois where she purchased a pen, notepaper, and envelopes. At 8 o'clock p.m., she was sighted at Sullivan's Food Store in Winnipago, again unoccupied. At 11.15 p.m., she checked into the Rockford Inn in Rockford, Illinois, where sometime that night or the next morning, she took her own life by slashing her wrists and neck and overdosing on antihistamines. At 12.30 p.m. on May 14, 2011, her body was found by a hotel maid along with a note. In the note, Amy Pitson apologized for the mess she had created and explained that Timothy would never be found, but was completely safe with the people who would care for him. Police found the knife that Amy Pitson had used to kill herself and it contained her blood. Also, a concerning amount of blood was found in her car, which belonged to Timothy. However, a family member later revealed that the stains were likely caused by a nosebleed Timothy had suffered in the car earlier that month. It was also noted that Amy Pitson's cell phone was missing. An examination of her vehicle revealed that it had been parked in a grassy area, possibly near a stream, but close to a highway. To this day, no new information has came out about Timothy Pitson or where he is. James Pitson, Timothy's father, stated that he believes his son is still alive somewhere. So, what do you think happened to Timothy Pitson? Did his mom sell him to someone for money and with the guilt she took her own life? Or was his mom extremely depressed and she just gave him away to family members? Or was Timothy Pitson murdered? These questions cannot be answered to this day and this case still remains a complete mystery. When a man asked his wife to buy him alcohol, no one could have guessed it would end in murder. Danielle and Skylar Nemetz met in October 2012 on Facebook. Danielle was a junior in high school in California and was described by friends and family as bubbly and friendly. Skylar lived close by and had just graduated. They hit it off after connecting in person at a sports game where Danielle was cheerleading. The relationship started progressing really quickly and Danielle actually ended up moving in with Skylar and his parents. Now this was quite concerning considering the change in Danielle's demeanour. She was a lot more reserved than usual and Skylar made no real effort to get to know her loved ones. Just three months after they met, Skylar proposed to Danielle. She accepted and then worryingly decided to drop out of high school. They ended up tying the knot just five months after meeting. Skylar was working in the army at this point and the pair ended up moving away to Washington as he was stationed in Fort Lewis. Interestingly, the pair enjoyed spending time at shooting ranges. Skylar spent her time with her new puppy and she also got a job. Although she was away from her loved ones, she did stay in touch. However, red flags about the relationship would be noticeable even from afar. Behind the scenes, Skylar was abusive to Danielle. He was controlling and had issues with jealousy and alcohol. Danielle told a friend that Skylar had smashed her phone in a fit of rage. In 2014, Skylar asked Danielle to buy him alcohol for when he got back from battlefield training. They were actually both under 21, so Danielle knew she would have to get someone else to purchase the alcohol. Danielle ended up contacting some guys that she knew who were over the age of 21. However, when Skylar found out about this, he would be incredibly jealous and angry. It was the 16th of October and Skylar just returned home. He ended up drinking and Danielle was on FaceTime to one of her friends and she seemed just her normal, happy self. Minutes after she hung up the phone, she would be dead. A neighbour called police to report gunfire. They arrived to the scene to find Danielle dead. 
Skylar had shot her and then put all of the firearms in the house away and also disposed of the alcohol. When police got there though, Skylar was acting like he was really distressed. He was calling out for his dead wife. Skylar claimed that he'd accidentally shot her while putting away weapons for the day while she was doing some work on the computer. However, that doesn't make sense as to why he didn't then call an ambulance as soon as it happened or try to revive her in any way or get any sort of help from anyone. It also doesn't explain why he wasted so much valuable time hiding weapons and alcohol. At the murder trial, texts from Skylar to Danielle were shown which displayed his emotional abuse. A friend of Skylar also testified at the trial about how angry Skylar was to find out that guys had bought the alcohol. The jury ended up really torn. They felt like Skylar seemed rehearsed and over-exaggerated in court, but then they said so did the friend who testified against him. They felt that it hadn't been proved entirely that Skylar did intend to shoot Danielle, so he was found guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was given just 13 and a half years in prison. Hamira, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. Like have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with grey hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer and cannibal. This is the site of the 2011 Zanesville, Ohio animal massacre. And if there's ever a story that needs a trigger warning, it's this one. This is Terry Thompson. He was a Vietnam War veteran and an exotic animal collector. He owned a 73 acre farm near Zanesville, Ohio and turned it into a private zoo called the Muskingum County Animal Farm, where he kept many exotic animals throughout the property. On October 18th, 2011, shortly before 5 p.m., Terry set 50 of his animals loose into the town of Zanesville and then fatally shot himself in the head. His body would then be part partially eaten by his own animals. As sunset was approaching, multiple 911 calls started pouring in about dangerous wild animals roaming around the countryside. And what followed would turn out to be a deadly massacre. 911, is this a hoax or is there truly- No, it's, it's true. And if you see anything, stay indoors. Remain indoors. Don't try to approach them. We've got many in while the animals were on the loose, people were urged to stay indoors and all of the schools in the area were cancelled. Police were then faced with the unthinkable and they ended up fatally shooting 48 animals before they could terrorize the town. Luckily, no humans were attacked, but the scene was something straight out of a nightmare. Police killed 18 Bengal tigers, 17 lions, 6 black bears, 3 cougars, two grizzly bears, two wolves, and a baboon that were roaming the town. According to one police officer, he said the scene was so gruesome and the smell alone made him unable to sleep for two weeks. A responding officer also said that the animals were exhibiting aggressive behavior and at times it was almost a hand-to-hand -hand combat with them. The bodies of the deceased animals were all lined up the next morning and were then put into a bucket loader to be buried on Terry's farm. What's crazy is that you can still view the photos of the crime scene online, although I don't recommend it. They are incredibly graphic. While the animals were being loaded up, a handful of people came along and tried to steal a lion's dead body, but thankfully they were caught and arrested for that. Authorities also discovered six animals that were alive in cages in Terry's home. They found three leopards, a small grizzly bear, and two monkeys. Those animals were tranquilized and taken to the Columbus Zoo. One monkey was never found, and it was assumed to have been eaten by another animal. But according to experts on the scene, it was highly likely to have carried the herpes B virus. So the fact that it was never found is a little scary. Many people think that this situation could have been prevented. Terry was reported multiple times before his death for unsafe housing for the animals, and he also didn't provide them with sufficient food and water. His animals would often escape his poorly fenced yard and cause damage to the neighbor's property. Along with that, he was also cited in the past for animal abuse and neglect, but in 2011, at least in Ohio, it wasn't illegal to own exotic animals. But following this massacre, Ohio's exotic animal laws took full effect in 2014. As for why Terry might have done this, leading up to the incident, he was in extreme debt, he had just separated from his wife, and he was also facing house arrest after a year in prison for a gun conviction. So it seems like he might have just snapped. There's a whole documentary about this called Horror at the Zoo, and it's an insane watch. This is the awful and disturbing murder of Shanda Sherry, one of the most unsettling true crime cases ever. In the early morning of January 11th, 1992, 12-year-old Shanda Sherry was abducted from her home in Indiana and tortured to death by four teenage girls in extremely inhumane ways. Melinda Loveless, Lori Tackett, Tawny Lawrence, and Hope Rippey, all four of these girls had somewhat of an extremely rocky home life growing up, with allegations of molestation and physical abuse from family members. 
In junior high, Melinda Loveless started dating a girl named Amanda Heaven. However, their relationship was extremely toxic and they broke up. But fast forward to October of 1991, and this is where Amanda meets Shanda and their friendship turns into a romantic relationship. This angers Melinda and she begins discussing ways to murder Shanda. So Melinda put together a plan to have her three friends knock on Shanda's door. A little after midnight on January 11th while she hid in the back of Lori's car under a blanket with a knife. The girls would then go and tell Shanda, who they never actually met, that they were friends with Amanda and that they wanted to hang out. But when Shanda got into the car, Melinda jumped out of the back seat and held the knife to Shanda's throat. They then drove Shanda deep into the forest to an abandoned house, where they stripped her naked, tied her up, and brutally beat her for seven hours straight. Melinda tried to cut Shanda's throat, but the knife was too dull, so instead she just strangled her until she was unconscious. All four girls and threw Shanda in the trunk, went back to Lori's house to enjoy soda and clean up. At one point, Shanda woke up and began screaming, so Lori repeatedly stabbed her in the chest multiple times. The girls then got back in the car and drove around for a couple more hours. During the ride, Shanda, who was still alive and stuffed in the trunk, started crying and when Melinda opened the trunk, Shanda sat up covered in blood with her eyes rolled back in the back of her head. Melinda then beat Shanda with a tire iron until she went conscious. She even said that she felt her skull cave in. They then continued driving until they found a burn pile. They then wrapped Shanda in a blanket, sprayed her with Windex and covered her in gasoline and set her on fire, but despite all of this, Shanda was still alive. That was until the girls noticed she was still alive and they went back and set her on fire again, killing her. All four girls then left to go eat breakfast while Shanda burnt to death. Melinda Loveless joked about Shanda's burnt body by saying she looked like the breakfast sausage she was eating. The next day though, Shanda Sherry's body was discovered by two hunters. Tony and Hope then broke down and confessed to the police about the murder. And all four girls were charged with the murder of Shanda Sherry. Tony was sentenced to 25 years, Hope was sentenced to 35 years, and Lori and Melinda were sentenced to 60 years in prison. But what makes this disturbing and sickening case even more sickening, all four of these girls are out of prison and free walking the earth, despite having little to no remorse of what they did to Shanda Sherry. The Shanda Sherry case remains one of the most disturbing and haunting true crime cases out there, because these were all young teenage girls who were doing something extremely horrible to another girl. This was one of those cases that were extremely hard to read, and rest in peace to Shanda Sherry. What you're about to see is the horrific footage that was taken from the inside of Willowbrook State School, which was an asylum in New York for children with intellectual disabilities. Viewer discretion is advised. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. This is Willowbrook State School. The name makes it sound like it was a lovely place, but really it was described as hell on earth. Willowbrook was a state-supported institution for children with mental disabilities on Staten Island that operated from 1947 to 1987, and it sat on 375 acres. It was originally designed to hold 4,000 children, but it eventually held up to 6,000, making it incredibly overcrowded. No one really knew what was going on at the school until 1972, when an investigative journalist named Geraldo Rivera received a phone call from a doctor at the school. The doctor told Geraldo about the horrific conditions there and wanted the public to know what was truly happening to these kids. So Geraldo visited the school, and what he found was horrifying. Just upon walking into the school, Geraldo said that the smell was so atrocious that he can remember it even today. It was clear that the kids were being severely neglected and abused. They were living in filth and dirt, their clothes were all torn and ragged, and most of them were covered in their own feces. Their rooms were compared to animal cages at the zoo, but worse. Geraldo created an expose that was aired on TV, and it uncovered physical and sexual abuse against the children by members of the school staff. Not not only that, but the doctors at Willowbrook were essentially just conducting wildly unethical medical experiments on these children. 
Outbreaks of hepatitis at the school were really common, which led to years of terrifying experiments and studies on the kids to figure out why 90% of them contracted the virus within six months of entering the school. One of the studies was feeding the live hepatitis virus from infected stool samples to 60 healthy children. The doctors would then sit back and watch as their skin and eyes turned yellow and as their livers got bigger. The kids became extremely sick, but the doctors justified their actions by saying that they were probably going to get the virus anyway. They felt that they weren't causing any harm because they were just kids with mental disabilities. Geraldo's expose shed light onto how kids and people in general with disabilities are treated. The film is called Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace, and it's one of the most disturbing things that I've ever seen. The school was officially shut down in 1987 after public outrage, and parts of the building were eventually used for the College of Staten Island. What's also crazy is the fact that Andre Rand, who is a suspected serial killer and connected to a series of child kidnappings, previously worked at Willowbrook as an orderly. One of his suspected victims, 12-year-old Jennifer Schwager, was found buried in a shallow grave behind Willowbrook. But at that point, the school had already been abandoned. The expose is an extremely difficult watch, but it did spark a lot of change. This is the unbelievable story of Colleen Stan, otherwise known as the girl in the box. In 1977, 20 year old Colleen had a friend's birthday party to attend. She decided to catch a lift at the side of the road. She'd done this many times before, so thought she knew what she was doing. She turned down lifts from two cars, suspecting that they were unsafe. And when another car pulled over with a couple inside, she peered inside the car and saw a baby in the back seat, so thought it was perfectly safe to catch a ride. Around 20 minutes into the drive, the car pulled onto a dirt track. Cameron Hooker, the driver, got out, pulled Colleen off the back seat, held a knife to her throat and forced her into the trunk of the car. A wooden soundproof box that weighed 20 pounds was placed over her head and she was driven to their home in Red Bluff, California. She was then forced into the basement where she was tortured and bound. This was just the start of the horror that Colleen would endure at the hands of this deranged couple. They eventually moved out of their home and moved into a trailer with Colleen and their child. They no longer had a basement to keep Colleen in, so Cameron decided to make a coffin-sized box to keep under their bed. Colleen was kept in here sometimes up to 23 hours a day, only being let out to satisfy Cameron's needs or to be tortured. Cameron and Janice conceived another child and Janice actually gave birth above Colleen on the waterbed. Colleen was sometimes let out of the box to look after the two children and she could have made a run for it on multiple occasions, so why didn't she? Cameron had told Colleen that he was part of a mafia gang called The Company and that if she ever tried to escape she'd be killed alongside her family, so she stayed. Colleen had been completely brainwashed by Cameron and Janice to the extent that Cameron actually took her to see her parents one day and she didn't say a single word about the abuse or kidnapping, instead telling them that Cameron was her fiancé. Her parents were actually really relieved. They believed that she'd run away and joined a cult and they actually took this picture of her and Cameron. Colleen was then taken back to the trailer where the abuse continued. She was regularly tortured, beaten, whipped, burnt and suspended from the ceiling by her wrists, wearing the £20 soundproof wooden box on her head. Colleen was eventually that brainwashed that Cameron believed if he let her have a bit of freedom, she wouldn't tell a soul about the abuse or the kidnapping and he eventually got her a job as a maid in a hotel. By this point, he'd also decided he was going to make Colleen his second wife. This news didn't go down well with Janice, and she decided she had to get rid of Colleen. Janice told Colleen that everything Cameron had said about the Mafia was a total lie. There was nobody out to kill her or her family. And Colleen rang Cameron and told him that she wasn't coming back. She then returned home. Despite being back home with her parents, Colleen didn't tell anybody where she'd been for the last seven years. She told nobody about the kidnapping or the abuse. She was fully in the midst of Stockholm Syndrome and stayed in touch with Cameron, believing that he could be reformed. In the end, it was actually Janice that went to the police and told them everything. She'd been convinced by a priest after confessing that she had to stop him doing this to someone else. Cameron Hooker was arrested and he was described by the judge as the most dangerous psychopath he'd ever encountered. Janice testified in court against Cameron in agreement that no charges would be brought against her for the abuse that Colleen endured. Thanks to all the overwhelming evidence from Colleen and Janice, Cameron was found guilty of kidnap, torture and rape, and he was sentenced in 1985 to 104 years in prison. Colleen Stan is now 66 and she's a mother and grandmother. Her and her family celebrate the anniversary of her escape from the hookers every year at the beach, and she also counsels other women that are survivors of abuse.
The man's ex-wife died in a tragic accident, or so people thought. It wasn't until his next wife vanished that things got really scary. Drew Peterson had many wives over the years. In 1974, he married Carol Brown. The pair had two children, but the marriage ended when he cheated. He then married Vicki Connolly in 1982, but then got divorced as well. In May 1992, Drew and Kathleen Savio had just got married. Now Kathleen, as you can see, was beautiful and was working as an accountant. Drew was originally from Chicago and he was in the army and then embarked upon a career in the police. In 1979, he was actually named police officer of the year by his department. The pair got married just after Drew divorced his second wife and people could see that he was moving on quickly. The pair lived in Illinois together and had two children. However, things were far from perfect and heartbreakingly, Kathleen confided in people close to her that Drew was abusive. Despite people knowing about this, Drew managed to maintain a great reputation in the local community. Between 2002 and 2004, the police were actually called to the pair's home over 18 times. This was regarding issues of domestic violence. On the 10th of October 2003, the pair actually got divorced, but the issues did continue. Now, far from being distraught about his third divorce now, Drew actually had started to move on very quickly again. The 49-year-old began dating 19-year-old Stacy Kales. Just eight days after divorcing Kathleen, he got married to Stacy. Then, shockingly, on the 1st of March 2004, Kathleen's bruised body was found face down in the bathtub. Frustratingly, her death was ruled an accident despite there being evidence that this was actually a homicide. Drew and Stacy went on to have another two children and Stacy actually adopted Kathleen's children. Stacy was an intelligent woman and was actually working towards completing a nursing degree. Now, this was alongside being a devoted mother to her now four children. That's why it was so out of character when she all of a sudden vanished on the 28th of October 2007. Her sister Cassandra actually rang the police after becoming concerned of her whereabouts. Police started questioning anyone she knew. Drew claimed that he'd last seen her between 10 and 11 a.m. on the day she vanished. Drew also stated that he spoke to her at 9 p.m. that day and she told him she was running off with another man. Now, Stacy's car was actually found abandoned at an airport and Drew stated that this meant that she had in fact gone off to start another life. Stacy's family, however, just knew that she wouldn't leave her kids behind. On November the 9th, police announced that they believed Stacy was a victim of foul play. Drew was named as a person of interest in her disappearance and authorities then decided to take another look into Kathleen's death. Interestingly, Drew's ex-wife Vicky came forward to police to tell them some information about him. She said that when they were together, he was abusive and he once threatened to kill her and make it look like an accident. When they searched Drew's home, they made a worrying discovery. Significant items such as scuba diving weights, a nightstand and a large blue barrel big enough to house a human body were missing from the property. Police questioned neighbours and some eyewitnesses reported seeing Drew and his stepbrother, Thomas Morphy, removing the blue barrel from the house around the same time that she went missing. Thomas was interviewed by police and at this point made a shocking revelation. He admitted that Drew paid him to help him remove the barrel from the property. Thomas confessed to police that he felt he'd been unknowingly involved in maybe removing Stacy's body from the house. He was actually so distressed by this realization that he tried to unalive himself, but fortunately did not succeed. Stacy remains missing to this day and Drew has never been charged in connection with her case. He does, however, remain the prime suspect. As for Kathleen, her body was exhumed and although her original cause of death was classed as accidental drowning, investigators determined that she had actually been murdered and the scene had been staged to look like an accident. In 2012, Drew was found guilty of her murder. But things actually don't end there, and in 2015, there was another big revelation. Fellow prison inmate tipped off police that Drew was attempting to put out a hit on James Glasgow. Now, James was actually the lead prosecutor in his murder trial. The inmate decided to wear a wire and collaborate with the police in order to collect evidence. In 2016, he was found guilty of solicitation of murder and solicitation of murder for hire. Drew was given a total of 78 years in prison and thankfully won't be eligible for parole until he reaches the age of 127. This is the Kelly Ann Bates case, a true crime case you would never forget. Kelly Ann Bates was an English teenager who was murdered in Manchester, England at the age of 17 by her abuser, James Patterson Smith. She was tortured by him over a period of four weeks, including having her eyes gouged from their sockets, 
up to three weeks before her death before being drowned in a bathtub. In 1993, Smith began grooming Kelly Bates when she was 14 years old, having met her while she was babysitting for friends. Approximately two years later when she had left school, Bates moved in with Smith at his home in Funeral Road, Gorton. She was concealing the age difference between them from her parents, Tommy and Margaret Bates. Kelly Bates's mother knew something was wrong with Smith the first time she met him, and she said, as soon as I saw Smith, the hairs on the back of my neck went up. I tried everything I could to get Kelly away from him. Although Kelly Bates had left Smith briefly because of arguments with him, she was once more living with him at the end of November 1995. Her parents also noticed bruises on her, which she explained away as being results of accidents. Kelly Bates became increasingly withdrawn and at the end of December 1995, she resigned from her part-time job. In March 1996, Kelly Bates' parents received cards in the mail who they thought were from Kelly for their anniversary and birthday, but only Smith had written them. And when her brother tried to see her at Smith's house, Smith said she was not home. And when a concerned neighbor asked about her, she was briefly shown at an upstairs window. But on April 16th, 1996, Smith reported to authorities that he had accidentally killed his girlfriend during an argument in the bathtub, claiming that she had inhaled water and died following his attempts of resurrecting her. He also claimed that she often pretended to be unconscious. Police went to Smith's address and found Kelly Bates' naked body in a bedroom. Her blood was found throughout the house and a post-mortem examination revealed over 150 separate injuries on her body. During the last month of her life, she had been kept bound and sometimes tied to a radiator or furniture by her hair and other times by her neck using some sort of object. William Lawler, the home office pathologist who examined her body, said, In my career, I have examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I never came across injuries so extensive. These are the following injuries found on Kelly Bates' body. Scolding to her buttocks and left leg, burns on her thigh caused by the application of a hot iron, a fractured arm, multiple stab wounds caused by knives, forks, and scissors, Stab wounds inside of her mouth, crush injuries to both hands, mutilation of her ears, nose, eyebrows, mouth, lips, and genitalia, wounds caused by a spade and pruning shears, both eyes gouged out, later stab wounds to the empty eye sockets, and partial scalping. The pathologist determined that her eyes had been removed no less than five days and no more than three weeks before her death. She had been starved, having almost lost 20 kilograms in weight and not received any water for several days before her death. The injuries were not the result of one sudden eruption of violence. They must have been caused over a long period and were extensive and so terrible that the defendant must have deliberately and systematically tortured Kelly Bates. The cause of death was drowning, but immediately prior to this, she was beaten over the head with a shower head. The jury took only one hour to find Smith guilty of Kelly Bates' murder, sentencing him to life in prison. This case is absolutely horrible, and rest in peace to Kelly Ann Bates. There's a really strange missing persons case happening right now that everyone should be talking about. This is Dia Abrams. She mysteriously disappeared from her 117-acre California ranch in 2020, and the details surrounding her disappearance are odd. Dia was last seen on June 6, 2020 at around 2.30 p.m. by her boyfriend Keith Harper. The two had been living together since 2016. According to Keith, the two had lunch together at her Bonavista ranch house in Mountain Center where she told him that she needed to talk to him about something. But the two were reportedly supposed to go on a trip to Colorado the next day and the property needed worked on, so he pushed the conversation off. He then spent the next several hours mowing the meadow, and during that time, Keith said he received an ominous text from Dia saying, quote, you cannot save me from all things, end quote. Keith said he then returned to the ranch house at around 7.30 p.m. and Dia was gone. All of her personal belongings, including her Ford F-350, her phone, her purse, and her dog Ruby were all left behind. Keith said the entire time he was outside on the ranch, he had a clear view of the front gate and he didn't see anyone enter or leave. He then said that he spent the rest of the night searching for Dia, but when he couldn't find her, he reported her missing the next day to Riverside Police. 
The very next day, about 26 of Dia's neighbors, friends, and family came out and spent the entire day searching for her on the Bonavista property, but there was no trace of Dia. Her friends recall Keith sobbing that day, saying, quote, I'll never see her again. It would take the police a few days to come out and search the property, but suspiciously, Keith would leave before they could arrive. According to him, he spent the next week attending business meetings in Arizona and New Mexico, traveling in his RV. He apparently owns property in Arizona and a storage unit business in New Mexico. And like I said, this was all before police could search Dia's property or his RV. Keith claimed to be in contact with the police the entire time, but they actually had to track him down at a storage unit. They were able to search both the RV and the unit and ended up removing a section of the front driver's seat as evidence, as well as a list of evidence from his storage unit that hasn't been made public. Now, Dia's son reportedly learned of his mom's disappearance from her neighbors, not from Keith, the day she was reported missing. And when he went to the Bonavista Ranch to search for his mom, he said that her bedroom door looked like it was smashed in from the outside. He also discovered a handwritten note from Dia saying that she was scared for her life. When police officially did come out and search the property, they also found two shell casings on the front porch and drops of blood on a sheet in Dia's bedroom. But Keith has explanations for both of those findings. He says that the blood on the sheet is likely from a rare skin condition that he has that makes him bleed easily. And the shell casings on the front porch were probably from him shooting at a coyote. Dia was seen on her neighbor's ring doorbell video about five hours before she disappeared. It was around nine in the morning and she was bringing her neighbor a batch of freshly made cinnamon rolls. Her neighbor reportedly had cancer and was going through chemo and they had mentioned that they really wanted cinnamon rolls. So Dia made them for her. After this, she vanished multiple searches have taken place, including the Bonavista Ranch and one of her other properties called the Sky High Ranch. At the moment, it's not clear if the third property that she owns has been searched, but it's now been four years and Dia is still missing. The timeline of her disappearance is based entirely on Keith's statements since he was the only one present at the time she went missing, and police have named him a person of interest as a result, although he denies any involvement. During the investigation, police learned that just two weeks before Dia went missing, she made changes to her trust, naming Keith as a co-trustee of her estate, which also included her two other properties. And up until January of this year, Keith continued living on her ranch and even turned it into a short-term rental property, which was really suspicious to Dia's friends and family. You'd think that with her being actively missing, you wouldn't just let random people on the property. But in late 2023, a judge removed Keith as the co-trustee after he tried to list the ranch for sale. He reportedly contacted a listing agent and said that he owned the ranch for 16 years and wanted it listed for $5.2 million. And after learning that he improperly removed some of Dia's personal belongings from the property, a judge ordered him to vacate the ranch, which he did in January of this year. He's not allowed to return either. A new court-appointed co-trustee now has access to Dia's estate and has since listed two of her properties for sale, including the one that has possibly not yet been searched. The Bonavista Ranch hasn't yet been listed, but it is expected to be soon. According to authorities, if Dia Dia isn't found by June of 2025, half of her estate will go to her children, while the other half will still go to Keith. Those closest to Dia feels that Keith has more to do with her disappearance than he's letting on, and that's because of his past criminal history. He was previously convicted of two counts of unlawful sexual contact, and in 2002, he pleaded guilty to third-degree assault against his ex-wife. With the bizarre circumstances surrounding Dia's disappearance, her family thinks that she was definitely met with foul play. Her son believes that she was kidnapped, murdered at another location, and then had her body disposed of somewhere. According to them, Dia would never leave her ranch or her animals behind. She even refused to leave her property a few years back when there was a massive fire surrounding three sides of her land. It's now been four years, and whatever happened to Dia remains a mystery. If you have any information regarding her disappearance, please contact the number on the screen.